welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. We have been around for five and a half years at this point. Five and a half years. And I think we've done a pretty darn good uh, job of establishing ourselves as the church in Miami for people who don't go to church. Now that doesn't mean that we don't want people to come to church, right? What that means is, is that no matter where people are in, in their relationship with God, even if they have no relationship with God, even if they're ashamed of their life, they can feel welcome here at the Pulse of Miami Church. Maybe they haven't been to church. Maybe they were raised in church and now they're ashamed that they've been away from church for a long time. Listen, you're welcome here. If you lead a lifestyle that, that most Christians shun, listen, you're welcome here. That, that is the atmosphere that we've maintained here at The Pulse. And I'm proud to say that over the last five years, we've had around 250 people say yes to Jesus Christ in our church, right? That, we're just a small church, Right? The church that I came from was much bigger than us, and I can guarantee you that in the last five and a half years, they have had nowhere near 250 people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so here's what I want to say. I'm proud of that. But I also believe that there's a new day dawning for the pulse of Miami Church. And the new day is this, is we can no longer be satisfied with somebody coming into church, raising their hands, saying yes to Jesus Christ. We pray with them, we give them a Bible, we pat them on the back and we say, hey, good luck with this relationship with Christ that you have. That from now on, we need to have a culture in our church of discipleship, of, of not only bringing somebody in and having them say yes to Jesus. We want to continue to do that. We want to continue to be a church for people who don't go to church. But we also want to raise them up in a deep, long-lasting relationship with Jesus Christ. So today we're going to be talking about discipleship. Now I know that there are some of us who are here today who are going, you know what, Todd? It's about time. I've been waiting for you to get off this whole church for people who don't go to church thing. I've been waiting for you to start discipling with these people. But here's what I don't want you to hear that I'm going to be discipling with these people, right? Because here's what's been happening for the past five and a half years. I have been discipling with people. And some of you might be like, hey, wait a minute, he hasn't discipled with me. Because I'm one guy, right? What I'm going to ask is that more people get involved with this. And listen, I'm not even talking about the leadership of the church. I'm not, I'm not talking about people like Donnie and Mercy and, and Carmen and and uh, Marlon, and, and, and all of you guys who are actually doing that already, I'm talking about the people who've never even thought about discipling with somebody else. That it is time for us to start thinking about what that looks like. And so the question that I want us to ask, because it's tough, and I know what's going on inside of a lot of our hearts right now, we're scared. So why do we struggle with this whole thing called discipleship? Why do we struggle with discipleship? Because after all, and we're going to read this in a moment, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, go and make disciples. And here's the thing. He wasn't talking to Todd Peterson. Just Todd Peterson. He wasn't talking to just pastors or just disciples. Or he, he was talking to anybody who bears the name of Christ. Anybody who says, Christian, I am a Christian. He was talking to you. So why do we struggle so much with discipleship? You know, for those of you who are here, and myself included, we need to be asking ourselves a question. Even if we're already discipling with somebody, are we teaching them not only to obey Jesus, but are we teaching them to disciple other people? Have we even thought about that? Or perhaps you're here and you're a mature Christian and you've been to church for a long time and, and, and perhaps you discipled people in the past. But I've got a question for you. If I were to ask you, what are the names of the people that you're discipling right now? If those names aren't coming to your brain right now, that's a problem. And I think a lot of us are thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm past the time when I, when I should have been discipling with people, right? I've already done that in the past, and I'm, I'm in another area of my life. People don't want to listen to me anymore. No. 
Jesus didn't say, oh, you're going to disciple a couple people and then you're done. This is what we're supposed to be doing for the rest of our lives. So why do we struggle with discipleship, especially those of us who've already done it? And then there are those of us in here today who are perhaps being discipled. Did you know that Jesus doesn't want you to just be discipled? He wants you to start and you go, oh, wait a minute. I, I'm way too young. I'm, I, I don't know enough. What if they ask me questions that I don't know the answers to? Why do we struggle so much with discipleship? Before we open up scripture in order to answer this question, why do we struggle so much with discipleship? I want to explain what this is. I know a lot of you guys are going, what in the world is going on here? I went to a conference uh, a couple weeks ago, and there was a lady who actually had something similar set up on the stage, and she wanted to explain how we deal with change. And she was a great person to talk about this because she's a missionary. In fact, her and her husband... And then all her kids went to a different land to become missionaries, okay? So they, they were living in the United States. They had normal lives. God called them to, to sell everything and to go somewhere else and to be a missionary somewhere else. And she said that it was especially tough for the kids. And so they got to the uh, other place where they were living as missionaries and, and the youngest son especially was just having a really hard time and so there was, there was actually a class for missionaries while they were there to help them to learn how to adjust. And so she actually got this, this setup from that class. And so in that class, uh, this, this lady had this set up and she asked for a volunteer and this lady who's a missionary, her son the one who was struggling, decided that he would volunteer. And so, so the lady invited the son up to stand on the first chair. And while he was standing there, she, she was going, let me ask you, what, what was the best part of your home in the United States? What was the best part? Oh, I loved my room. My room was so cool. She goes, yeah, what would you do in the room? Oh, I would invite my friends over, and we played video games, and, and I had everything set up, and it was really great. And she goes, great. That's why I want you to stand on this chair, because this chair is solid, and that's what it felt like when you were living there. But do you remember the day that your parents told you that you were going to be moving to another country? Yeah. What did that feel like? Well, I was scared. And then she invited him to stand on this next chair. And he stands on the next chair. And, and he's, he, he kind of struggles and it, and it kind of wobbles and he has, to, he has to go down and grab it. And she says, what does that feel like? She, he goes, I, 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 I don't know if this is going to tip over. And she goes, was that kind of how it felt like when you were starting to pack up your stuff? He goes, yeah. And she says, now I want you to stand on the ball. And the kid was little, but he was smart enough to know that there was no possible way that he was going to be able to stand on the ball. And he goes, I can't stand on the ball. And then all of a sudden, his older brother pops up. And he goes, I got you, bro. And he came up and stood next to him and held his younger brother up as his younger brother tried to balance on top of the ball. And they were kind of laughing and giggling, but as they kind of calmed down, she said, she said that ball represents how it felt like when, when you were in the plane flying to this other country. Didn't it, how did it feel like when you, when you landed in another country and it didn't look anything like anything you ever knew? And he goes, I felt like I was going to fall off like this ball. She goes, exactly. But she says, that's where you're at right now. But here's what I can promise you. As you continue to take steps, it's going to get better. And so she invited the, the young man to step onto the next chair. And of course, he still had to struggle and, and, and hold on. But yet, she said, is this better than standing on the ball? He goes, yes. She goes, is it still uncomfortable? He goes, yes, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's better than the ball. And she goes, that's, that's what it's going to feel like. 
pretty soon. And then she says, I want to invite you to stand on this last chair. And she goes, because, because the longer you're here, the closer you get to standing there. And guess what? There's going to come a day where you're going to feel just as comfortable in this new country as you did in, in, in the U.S. And then here's the cool thing, and this is what she told him. She said, there's going to come a day where you're going you're gonna to have a home in the United States, and you're going to feel at home in other places in the world. Because there's not a whole lot of people that are brave enough to do this. She says, that's what change looks like. And as I watched her do this on the stage, I couldn't help but think of Peter from Scripture. And, and I want to explain to you. So, so where we're going to pick up the story is, is where Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. He's already, he's already done the whole uh, dying on the cross, and he's, he's resurrected, but he's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And, and he drops these last few words on the disciples. Remember, these are the words that are not just for the disciples. They are for anybody who says that they're a believer in Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that's the first part. Raise their hand. They say yes to Jesus. You baptize them. Woohoo! But there's a second part, verse 20. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I just want you to imagine you're Peter there. And Jesus is saying, now I want you to go do exactly what I did with you. And I want you to teach them everything that I taught you. And all of a sudden, Peter's heart begins to, to pound. That's scary. And then Jesus closes with this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Peter, I'm not going to allow you to do this on your own. I will be with you. Now, I believe that Peter did not fully understand what Jesus was trying to tell him. And the reason is, is because for Peter, this whole Jesus thing was a Jewish thing. Right? He, he didn't think of himself as a Christian. He was a Jew that found the Messiah. And everybody who was a follower of Jesus at this time was Jewish. And then the day of Pentecost came. And all the disciples started speaking in different languages from all over the, all over the world. Now, why, why would he mistake it? Because remember when Jesus said, uh, he said, make disciples of all nations. He's probably thinking to himself, well, the Jews are all over the place, right? He's thinking to himself, we, we need to be ministering and making disciples of Jewish people who are all over the Roman Empire. So the day of Pentecost comes and there's all these Jewish people from all over the, the known world who are visiting Jerusalem at that time and, and they all start, the, the disciples are starting to speak in other languages that they didn't know but the people around them knew. And they were hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in the language of the country that they lived in. Then all of a sudden, Peter gets up and he speaks. And when he preaches, 3,000 people get saved that day. They were comfortable. It, it was amazing. And then they started discipling with them. And then thousands more are, are, are coming to know Jesus. All Jewish. And so here's Peter. Peter's comfortable. He goes, man, I'm, I'm getting used to it. I like this, right? I feel comfortable here. But then God said, no, wait a minute. That's not what I meant. I'm glad all these Jewish people are getting saved, but there's a bigger vision, Peter. So God had his eyes on this guy by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman uh, commander in, in, the, in the military. He's a godly man. He was well respected by the Jews. And as he was praying one day, an angel appeared to Cornelius and said, there's, there's this guy by the name of Peter and he's got something to tell you. He says, he tells him exactly where Peter's staying. 
Send a couple guys to go bring Peter back to you. He's got something to tell you. So Cornelius gets up the next day and he's like, he's, he sends these two guys after Peter. Peter has no idea any of this is happening. And so in Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 9, it says, About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Peter's feeling confident. Thousands of people are coming to know Jesus. You know, I got this Jewish Christian, you know, Christian thing down. And so he goes up on the roof of this thing to pray. What's next, God? And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, I think that Peter probably had low blood sugar, right? Because that's what happens with my wife, like, right? When she's hungry... She either gets cranky or goes into a trance. It's like, hey, honey, 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 here, here, right? And so Peter goes into a trance. That's, that is to be expected. Or my son, too, because he's starving. I'm starving, Dad. Verse 11. He falls into this trance, and he saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. And here's Peter going, woohoo, picnic. Here comes the sheet. I wonder what's going to be on top. Verse 12, it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. All kinds, not just the kinds that he's supposed to be eating, also the stuff that Jews are not supposed to be eating. Verse 13, then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now this must have been a hungry man. I mean, can you, could you imagine that, right? That's like a manly thing, kill, eat, right? But Peter's like, hey, wait a minute. There's stuff on that sheet I'm not supposed to be eating. Verse 13. 14, surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Remember those words, impure or unclean. Remember last week we were talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember there was the same thing in the beginning of the story? They refused to eat the food that they weren't supposed to eat. Here's Peter going, oh, I've, I'm going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm not eating that. But then... Verse 15, the voice said something that would change Peter's life. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Wait a minute, the voice says. Don't call anything impure which God has made clean. Then, uh, verse 16, this happened three times, and then immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now, let me ask you guys a question, okay? You guys have been in this church for a little while now, taught you guys how to read scripture. When the Bible says it's something, or if it says something two or three times, what does that mean? It's important, right? This is life-changing. And so, in the trance, he went through that. Three, uh, but God, I can't eat it. Don't call anything that God has made clean and pure. So here's the Holy Spirit now inviting Peter to take a step unto something that Peter, I'm comfortable here. Verse 17 while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was because he was staying at Simon's house and stopped at the gate. So just about the time that he's coming out of this trance, these two guys show up. Verse 18, they called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And so in verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Verse 20, so get up, go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. 
verse 21, Peter took the step. It says, Peter, woo, went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Verse 22, the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests. By the way, that's a no-no. According to Jewish law, Jews were not to invite impure and unclean Gentiles to come into their house and to fellowship with them. But here's the crazy thing. God didn't want them to just come into his house. He went, wanted Peter to go to their house. And you know what that looked like? That looked like Peter stepping on the ball. Right? This is uncomfortable. This is impossible. And at that moment, Peter had to to depend on God to come over and hold him and say, I got you, bro. And he went into the house of Cornelius. And, and here's, here's what happened. You know, he's, he's already uncomfortable. He's getting ready to step on the ball. And then he walks into the house, and it's not just Cornelius. It's Cornelius and his family and all of his friends. And here's Peter. I don't know what to do here. So he says in verse 28, he says, I, I don't know, but he says, you are well aware it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And so he's there on the ball going, I don't get it. I, I've, I'm doing something that I've been told my whole life I'm not supposed to do. But God has called me to be here, and so I'm here. He says, can I ask you why you sent for me? Cornelius tells him the story of the angel coming to him. And how the angel said, Peter's got a message for you. And he told him exactly who Peter was and where Peter would be staying. And Peter was like, Watch his words, verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, verse 35, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. All of a sudden, Peter's mind poof, was blown. And at this point, I think he was... You guys, I know you guys can hear me, but this is for the video, right? So we got to make sure we've got the sound for that. He was reminded when Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. Oh, whoa, you, you mean you didn't mean Jews from all nations? No, you meant people from all nations? Man, this vision is a lot bigger than I thought it was. And in that day, he... After he had heard from Cornelius, he decided to share the gospel with a bunch of people who he wasn't even supposed to be associating with. And let me tell you, he was nervous and he was shaky, just like I am right now. But he shared the gospel. And then he had to go report to a bunch of Jews about what, Jewish Christians about what he had done. What were you doing over there? But he baptized them. Because when they raised their hands and they said yes to Jesus, they spoke in tongues just like the disciples had spoken tongues. Meaning that God's blessing was on the Gentiles too. And it took a long time, but eventually Peter stepped over and he felt comfortable. Witnessing not only to Jewish people, but also making disciples out of all people. So what does this have to do with us? 
Let me tell you something. This was probably one of the most uncomfortable sermons I've ever preached. Right? I don't know if you saw my legs. I was kind of doing this number. And it's, it's a lot like discipleship because discipleship is uncomfortable. But here's what we're going to find. But at the same time, it changes our lives. Perhaps because we're uncomfortable. Perhaps because we need God to say, man, I got you, bro. And we have to, we have to depend upon him. You see, when we're standing on these, man, we, we don't feel like we have to depend on God. But when you're doing discipleship and you're uncomfortable and you go, man, I don't know if this is going to work out. Then we have to depend on Jesus Christ a little bit more. And so discipleship is uncomfortable, but it changes our lives. And here's here's what we find with this story of Peter. Peter wasn't like the all-knowing guy. Come here, Cornelius. Let me tell you how to live your life, right? God was working on Peter at the same time that he was working on Cornelius. And that's the way discipleship works. And so if you're here today, and perhaps you're discipling with somebody, I want to encourage you to continue to disciple with them, but keep in mind that you need to be teaching them and encouraging them to disciple with others. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you're a mature Christian, you've You've done this thing and you've discipled with people, but you, you're not doing it right now. And here's, here's what I want to remind you. This was not some temporary thing. God called us to do this for the rest of our lives. You go, oh, but people are different today. My disciple, the way that I used to disciple is, you can't do that anymore. Yeah, great. So now you're going to have to feel uncomfortable. That's what God wants you to do, because when we're uncomfortable, then he changes our lives. You know, what's funny is um, I never thought, it had to be about six years ago, never thought six years ago when I ran into Caleb in T-Mobile that that was going to be a day that changed my life, right? Ran into Caleb. Caleb was part of our youth ministry at, at, at Wayside, but... Um, I was starting to kind of transition out and was getting ready to plant the Pulse of Miami Church. So I, I ran into Caleb. He's like, hey, man, because, I don't know, Caleb's like, he was trying to convince him to give him a phone for free or something. I don't know. You know how Caleb, he's always trying to work the next deal. And so, so Caleb was there, and he had, he's like, hey, man, what are you up to? And I told him about the Pulse of Miami Church and how we're starting this thing. And he's like, oh, man, I'll, I'll come by and help. And I'm like, you know, oh, okay, you know, like, a lot of people say that they're going to help, and then they don't. But then Caleb showed up, and he started helping. And, and then I've had an opportunity to continue to, to minister to him and to, and to disciple with him. And we've been through some tough stuff together, right? And then there was this, there was this really funny Sunday where he came in with bags under his eyes, well, which is probably most Sundays, right? But, but this one particular Sunday, he had tried to go home. Uh, to go to bed early. He's like, I was like, man, why are you so tired? He's like, oh, man, I had this buddy of mine. He was calling me last night. Like, I was on the phone with him all hours of the night. He broke up with his girlfriend. He's really depressed. And he goes, finally, I, I don't even know, you know, I realized, like, just, just come to church, man. So that's what he told him. Just come to church. He goes, so he's probably going to come to church. And then a couple hours later, there was Jose. Showed up. Jose raised his hand to receive Christ that day. Jose got baptized in our church. You know what? Caleb kind of started showing him the ropes. Eventually, though, Jose ended up going to another church. He got discipled for a little while at the other church. But then here's, here's what's the crazy part. God calls Jose back just about the time that Caleb begins to take his faith really seriously. And all of a sudden, this guy that that Caleb had led to Christ is now inspiring Caleb to become the man of God that, God that God has always wanted Caleb to be. You see, here's a crazy thing. Discipleship is uncomfortable, but it changes our lives. You know, maybe you're here today and you're just like, you know what, I, I don't feel comfortable with this thing. Well, what if they ask me questions that I don't know the answers to? You know where I got that one from? Mercy Griffiths. 
Because God was calling her to, to disciple with people. My kids were some of those people. And there was times where she was like, man, I'm a wreck today. She goes, I don't know how I'm supposed to disciple with these people. I go, as a wreck, because we're not supposed to come to them as a teacher, that we've got everything figured out. No, you don't have all the answers, and that's the point. But we'll walk together. That's what discipleship actually means. And here's the crazy thing. Since Mercy has started to disciple, I can, and Donnie can tell you this too, she is a completely different woman today than she was when she started because God has been changing her from the inside out. And so here's what I'm going to challenge you to do, church. We've got a Pulse reunion coming up this Saturday at my house. I'm asking you to invite somebody. Invite somebody who's already been to the church that you just haven't seen for a while. You got their phone number stuffed some, somewhere uh, in, in your, your phone. If you need their phone number and you're like, hey, I, I remember this person. Do you have their phone number? Just come talk to me. Come talk to any of the staff members. We'll try to connect you to them. Invite them to come to the Pulse Reunion. That's what this is all about. And then afterwards, invite them to come to the class that you're signed up for. Because at the end of the day, discipleship is uncomfortable and it changes our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just, as we begin to think about the people that you've laid on our hearts to be discipling. Lord, as, as we think about the Pulse reunion coming up, as we think about these classes, as we think about the, the new day that is dawning on our church, Lord, I pray that you would not let us just do church the same way. And Lord, this, this doesn't just have to do with raising other people up, Lord. It also has to do with us having faith to step out like Peter did and to have to put completely and utterly depend upon you. So Lord Jesus, help us to have an attitude of discipleship. Lord, help us to know that we don't, we don't have to have all the answers. All we have to have is you. And so Lord, uh, as this day is coming, it's coming on, on Saturday, Lord. I pray that you would place the people in our hearts that you would want us to contact. And Lord, even if they don't come, Lord, we reached out and we tried to expand your kingdom. And Lord, we believe that you'll do something.